Uh, you quickly find that it, it, it falls, falls apart. Yeah? Um, so, the other thing that's big these days is chatbots, right? Uh, I think you see a lot of chatbots, a lot of frameworks, a lot of uh, things with them. But there is a difference between what we do, um, which we call agents or, or assistants, and chatbots. And for, for the particular case that we've chosen to solve, uh, here's the difference. So, so imagine you're a busy executive, you, you're trying to get a meeting together, uh, and if you were to use a chatbot, you, you want to say something like, hey, schedule a meeting for us next week, right? And what a chatbot will say is, well, what day would you like me to organize that meeting? So if you try this with Siri, uh, it will do exactly this. Um, then you say, well, maybe Monday or Tuesday, uh, and then, okay, I really need it quicker. Uh, and it, it, it can't decide, right? You have to give it very specific instructions. So you say Monday, and then it'll say, well, what time? And at this point, you're like, I just want you to get the meeting together, right? And that's the difference, right? That this, what, in, what a real agent or real assistant would do for you is you just take it off your hands, right? Take that ambiguous instruction of schedule a meeting next week, sometime next week, figure out what's good, right? Confirm it, put it in your calendar, and send the invite, uh, to make sure that it, everything's done. Yeah. Um, and that's the real difference between chatbots and agents that we see. Okay. So let me just quickly introduce Evie. She's an intelligent assistant, schedules your meetings. And how does she do this? She, she reads and writes emails, interacts like a real person, right? So it's like a CEO's assistant, uh, follows up, books meeting rooms, learns your preferences. Exactly what you expect from a real human assistant, right? And that's, that's really the, the bar that we're trying to hit. Um, and did you know, only 45% of your workday is spent doing your job, right? A lot of it is spent on, on admin tasks, and this is really the broader picture that we're trying to, to address, and starting with scheduling <coughs> meetings, yeah? Uh, and if you're a, you're a mid-level manager in a big corporation, Easily six weeks a year is spent scheduling meetings, and that's what we're getting back for you, right? Uh, it's a quick video, I think. No, skip that. Okay, so let's talk about speaking human now, right? So, so this is Evie, this is assistant. It, it reads, it writes. Doesn't sound too difficult. We do it every day, right? Uh, but let's take a, a quick look at why it's such a hard engineering problem. Lunch. When you think about the word lunch, you and I have a shared experience of what that means, right? A shared common understanding of what the word lunch is. Uh, it's a meeting, right? We typically involve a face-to-face -face meeting. You can't have a uh, lunch call, really. I mean, it's then more of a call than it's an actual face-to-face -face lunch. It's got a certain time range, right? It starts typically between 11.30 to maybe, and then the latest time you would have, you would end your lunch is maybe about 2, 2.30. Right? Anything later than that, you probably do a coffee instead. Um, and it needs a venue, right? And there's typically food involved. So from that one word that you and I share, <coughs> there's actually a whole uh, deep level of, of understanding that the machine doesn't know about, right? And the machine needs to be taught about. And this is just one word. Imagine all the words that we use in the context of scheduling. So that's the first reason why it's hard. Then there's the whole syntax. Sorry, going the wrong way. Syntax versus semantics. So uh, <coughs> free at five, I have to run at six. So again, it comes to the, the, the meaning of the word. So that you've got free at five, I have to run at six, right? And implicitly, that means kind of I want to end the meeting at six. Um, then a very similar sentence I'm busy at five, but I'm available at six. And to the machine, and you, if you throw this into something like word to vec uh, which is one of the, the uh, vector space learning models, uh, these are going to look very, very similar to a machine. Uh, because in if you look at uh, the structure of the, the sentence, they're very, very similar. But the meanings are almost completely reversed because of the, the particular meanings of the words themselves. Right? So these are things, some of the things that make things difficult. A lot of uh, neural nets and uh, big learning, big data learning approaches focus on structure, 
uh, and if the structures are similar, those are things that kind of tend to match, right? But in this case, the specific word, the detail really, really matters. Here's another one. That's me, Thursday or Friday afternoon works. Really simple sentence, right? Um, but if you, if you really break it down, there's a whole lot of processing that you do very automatically. Friday afternoon, pretty straightforward, right? But you know what? Chances are that afternoon applied to Thursday as well, right? And so you, you're, getting, you're gonna have to multiply that afternoon out between Thursday and Friday. And then the other thing is, you gotta treat Thursday or Friday afternoon as one element and apply that to the word works, right? Um, and these are things that machines don't know. Uh, and these are things that you need to teach them or, or put in place a structure that you, you can use uh, in order to, to get the right result, right? Because ultimately it's about people. Uh, one last example. Let's do coffee at Holland Village. Let's say Starbucks or Yakin, right? So first of all, Relatively easy to pick out coffee, HV, Starbucks, Yakun, right? Um, but again, you have a bit of this interesting uh, context that's happening, right? What is HV? In the context of Singapore, it probably means Holland Village. For someone in San Francisco, it probably means something else altogether, right? Uh, and then on top of that, you then need to graph the fact that Starbucks and Yakun are very specific places within a region called Holland Village, right? And it's, so it's not just being able to look at the words in isolation, but you need to have this whole model of the world behind you in order to get the right meaning from the text, right? So you have to look a lot deeper. Um, so that's some of, some of the reasons why it's hard. And let's say you, you do get the complete understanding of the sentence, right? Let's say I'm in Hong Kong next week. Fairly straightforward, it's a fact, right? Um, this person is saying that he will be in Hong Kong over this period of time, start time, end time. Fairly straightforward. Uh, but in the context of scheduling a meeting, you don't really know. This isn't like saying, no, I'm not free, or yes, I'm free, right? It's kind of an orthogonal kind of statement, just a statement of a fact. And you need to actually bring in some context uh, around what is it that you're trying to do before you can decide what, what it is. And, and this, uh, again, makes it difficult to apply very standard, simplistic mapping models to text, right? So where's the meaning? If the meeting I'm trying to organize is actually in Hong Kong, then next week's a good time. But if it's in Singapore, then maybe it's not a good time, right? Uh, or was I trying to organize a call in which case I don't care, except I just have to adjust for the time zone? Uh, and did I have any other personalization parameters? And only then can I choose from among a kind of set of decisions, right? Uh, would I propose a time next week? I find another time, uh, change the meeting to a call. Yeah? So, literally, once you have the surface level understanding, you still need to go deeper, bring in the context around the task that you're trying to do. Uh, and actually reason from it in order to get to kind of the right set of po possible decisions, yeah? Yeah, and so, you know, if you're ever curious about uh, natural language and what a natural language pipeline looks like, um, this is a very high level view of it. Uh, it starts with, uh, there's a whole bunch of pre-processing. So from an email, you, need, you take an email, you gotta figure out like what is the actual text that comes out of it versus the five previous emails that were quoted. You gotta separate that part of it. Then you have to take that and you have to go and find the signature and extract that because there's some interesting things you can do with the signature versus the, the actual text. Uh, but then you get the text, right? So you do all that pre-processing, you get your text, and now you put it through this pipeline and you say, well, First thing you need to do is to tokenize, right? So fairly standard, well understood task, break things. And the machine just sees this whole line of text, right? We need to break it down into, into individual words, right? 
uh, not as easy as you might think, as you might expect. Then we tag it, parts of speech. Uh, is this a verb? Is this a noun? Is it a preposition? Is it past tense, present tense? Uh, is this a plural form of a, of a base word? Uh, then we, we enrich it with an ontology. That's really a fancy way of taking the word lunch and adding all the information we know about lunch uh, into the pipeline. Uh, and then, so now we have these atomized words. Now we start building it up again in order to get some meaning out of it, right? And so we take a semantic chakra, the meaning of the, we use the meaning of the words. We talk about the Thursday and Friday afternoon, you know, grouping those things together, uh, figure out Starbucks and Yakun and Holland Village. Uh, and then we start building that into a graph uh, and then synthesize information, uh, route it to the right task. Is this, is this a response to an existing meeting I'm trying to schedule? Is this a new meeting? Is, is someone sent a new email thread but asking me to reschedule another meeting? Uh, do another round of contextual enrichment and then out comes a structured language representation. Yeah? Uh, so this is really the, the core pipeline for the natural language processing engine. And, and you know, at a very high level, it's probably consistent with most of the, the NLP processing pipelines out there. And that's just understanding the language, right? So it turns out to do scheduling well at like a rail assistant, there's a whole bunch of other things you need to do, right? You actually need to figure out what a good slot is. So if someone said next week, so do I suggest Monday, Tuesday, is it also Thursday or Friday, what times? How many people are involved? What time zones they are? Uh, is there a meeting room available? A bunch of factors go into that. Um, we talked a little bit about the location modeling. Google Office, again, like HV, very, very context specific. In this case, it's personal, right? Or it's a, uh, or you could say Starbucks, and Starbucks to you means this Starbucks, and Starbucks to someone else means another Starbucks. Uh, dynamic workflows, so, you know, we've seen meetings that were organized, they started out as a lunch, and then somebody rescheduled, turned into coffee, or, oh, I can't make that, how about we, we meet at another time, and then turn it, it just ends up in a call. So, you know, and, and if you're an engineer, you know that you usually want to build to a spec, right? You say, well, my spec says A, B, C, D, E, and I'm going to build so it does A, B, C, D, E. But in the real world, stuff is a lot more fluid, right? So, so another engineering challenge is how do you support that level of fluidity uh, at scale, right? Without kind of just getting yourself tied up in knots. And of course, at the end, you also need to output something, right? Not only does EB read emails, she also needs to write emails. And, and to write emails, you need to be able to talk like a real person. And a lot of it is actually being responsive to what just happened before or what happened like right at the start. And so that when you, when you then take an action, you're able to explain why you did something. And that's, that's another pretty important thing that, that is critical for machines to be able to talk like people, right? I mean, we respond so naturally to, to events that, uh, and we, we build that into the words we use in, in such, a, such a dynamic manner uh, that it's, it's hard for machines, right? So, yeah, so these are all the fun challenges. Um, and uh, if you enjoy hard problems, come talk to me later, software engineers, NLP specialists, data science experts. Um, and now it's question and answer time. Because um, we have a broad audience, really open, what can I tell you guys about? All right, so uh, my question is, how is EB's understanding of language different from, say, plug you to something that, I don't know if like, like Siri, right? Yeah. How, how, how is it different? How is it different? Uh, I think with, with Siri and with chatbots in general, they tend to deal with one line at a time. And they really focus on at the moment, more information based, right? Showing the spot scores, or uh, what's the time, or the actions can be restricted to voice actions, which is do this, turn, play this song, turn on my music, or set my alarm. And these are very, uh, I think it's not so much the understanding of language, it's not as much as the scope of the task that they, they do, right? Uh, and with Siri, it's nice that if it doesn't understand, if it doesn't know what you want to do, it just throws you back to a web search. And that's the default fallback. Does that answer the question? Okay. How does EV deal with like, 
typos or So in case anyone didn't hear, the question was, how does EV deal with typos or colloquialisms? Uh, so if you notice, Google has a pretty good spelling error, error detector, right? I mean, it, it's probabilistic in some ways. Uh, colloquialisms are harder because, simply because the surface meaning of the words is kind of different. Right? And, and that, there's really no way around the same telling the machine about very specific Oh, uh, no, no, no. I mean, I think ultimately you need to get to be able to handle the type of reasonable type of right? Um, I don't think you can do it in an isolated phase because whether something is a typo or not is very contextual depending on the surrounding world. So most of your language, the cell check, the cell check, are actually based on the context, right? So the end of the creation. Did you build your own NLP system, or did you go with something on the market, like with AI or something? Else? So we built our own on top of open source components, right? So the, the two problems that are fairly well solved are speech tagging, tokenization, uh, and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel on that. Those are actually machine learn, uh, machine learning models. You can train them on your own corpus if you want. They come free trained models. Uh, but beyond that, we built our own stack, right? Um, there was, uh, I mean, this, one of the things I didn't call out there is that one of the things we do is we don't do single lines of text or conversation. We have to read an entire email that's addressed not only to us but to multiple people. So there might be a conversation going, and at the end, it's literally a line that says, EV, do this, right, to set up the meeting. But in all that text, that there was a conversation, there was context around when, where, and, and who that we need to extract a lot of information from. So it's, it's given the level of complexity is like we had to build our own staff. Yeah, my question is actually around the same topic. I was wondering how much you can tap into open source or what's your view of the open source communities are in terms of controlling the process. Right. Or whether you have to build more and also whether you have to build the open source. So I think it depends very much on what you want to do uh, with it. I mean if you want to build a chat about there are there are a zillion different chatbot frameworks right now, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if Wit or AI has a full chatbot interface, but uh, API.ai does, which is the Google equivalent. Uh, certainly a lot of basic natural language processing is there for you. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, if you wanted to build something like Eevee, I think that's something you have to build yourself. Or for. How do you plan or process that's a problem for us uh, right now. I mean, I mean, it's a question of that's what we're, we're building a. We're not trying to build something that only does everything. So it's, it's trying to build it as, in a general way as possible, right? So being able to detect user feedback uh, where they write back to you and say, "No, you got it wrong," is you know, relatively straightforward, right? You use the same foundational engine that you have to understand intent, to also understand everything. Uh, but that's, you know, it's, uh, it's just a lot of work that we do that. Someone else have something that I missed? Can I ask you, because there's a, you were saying that there's a specific difference between chatbots and uh, natural language in your, in your slides, right? I wonder how this, how do you address the fact that uh, Learning. How is your how is how is EV learning? Because chatbot, you know, there's a different way it learns, right? Is it different in EV or is it, you know roughly around the same parameters? So I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, does EV learn any differently from chatbots? Is that a fair paraphrase of the question? Uh, you know, with maybe one or two exceptions, I don't know how much actual learning happens in the way that you and I think about learning, right? Um, any machine learning experts here?
No, so I can say what I can. I want to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the deep learning, machine learning stuff really has been categorized more accurately if we strip away the marketing as applied statistics, right? And a lot of times that's what it is. Uh, they learn certain things within the framework that you have set up for them. So if you phrase the problem in a particular way, if you frame the problem such that it's a machine learning problem, within those bounds it learns, right? It's more likely it just waits to get to, to match your data set. Um, but I'm not aware of anything that really is able to integrate new concepts today to actually take an unknown situation and apply reasoning to it. Um, that's, I think, beyond what the state of the art is today. So, when you talk about learning, I think, I think it needs to be, are you talking about getting better at picking out certain parts of the text versus getting, being able to handle unknown scenarios of, that it's not been programmed for? And that last bit definitely doesn't exist anywhere. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. So I've got a question from a marketing perspective. Yep. So this is something that's relatively new. Um, you know, it hasn't quite existed before, at least in Singapore. Yep. Um, what is your approach to going to market and after that? Because I know you guys went live last year? Yep. In the last year. Yeah. And then after that, capturing market share, what were your approaches? Um, I think what's interesting, one of the things we learned is that this isn't a product for everyone. Uh, it's not a mass market product because most people, in their, especially in their personal or social life, don't do enough scheduling for this to make sense. Uh, so it turns out there's a fairly uh, specific group of people whom it appeals to. One of the earliest groups of users who, who really got into this, into EB, was were people who used to have assistants. So they used to work in a big company, whether it's, uh, and they used to, like a, a consulting company, they had an assistant, or at least a shared assistant. Then they came out, they started, did a startup, or they have a consulting firm. And then, when they hear about this, they, they kick the tires, they schedule two or three test meetings, they get it, and they're like, well, I love it, right? And then they're off to the races. Um, and it turns out, like, you know, having an assistant, it takes some, some getting used to, right? You need to be able to um, instruct, give the right instructions uh, within reason, right? Because right? even human assistants don't read your mind. Uh, so, so I think to answer, come back to your question around going to market, I think a lot of it has been finding the right groups of users. People will schedule a lot of meetings, recruiters, uh, startups, right? Resource constrained startups, BD, BD guys, salespeople. Um, the other thing is virality, right? As EV schedules meetings with other people, they say, hey, what's this? Right? And then they get, excuse me, they get curious and they can check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still, it's still early, early days. Yeah. Yeah. Just one question about um, what you call it, the way EV learns, right? Mm -hmm. um, does it learn from a one-on-one -on -one basis? Like, say, for example, if it's actually vertical, uh, talking with <coughs> one particular uh, person, versus you have like an entire organization which is actually using EV, mm -hmm. does it learn what you call uh, phonetics or whatever, uh, the context of all the different people together or it's always a one-on-one -on -one basis? Or can it apply this learning from this person to a different person? Uh, yeah, actually, why don't you repeat the question? Because I'd like to hear it again. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, uh, does it have the capability to learn from different people in one organization and then apply that learning in multiple ways? I think um, there are things that you, I'd say you, you acquire information as a process of scheduling. If you say, in the process of scheduling one meeting, you say, I'm going to be away next week in Hong Kong or whatever. That's something that you will pick up and say, okay, this person's going to be in Hong Kong next week, right? Uh, and we'll use that for future scheduling or other meetings, right? Certainly that pieces, yeah. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting work around uh, figuring out if you're sent an email and you ask to schedule a meeting, 
are there multiple organizations involved? What's the power dynamic? Is one a client, one a vendor? Uh, I think these are things that, that are works in progress. There's a lot of subtlety, a lot of uh, uh, things that kind of happen immediately, but uh, sorry, that happen naturally for humans that for machines they don't do. Uh, I'm not, probably doesn't quite address the question, but also because I'm not quite sure uh, what, could you give me an example of what group learning versus individual learning would mean? So, so obviously I come from a uh, Sorry. Uh, it's a recruitment organization where right. we have like right. 100 recruiters right. continuously scheduling meetings okay. all the time. Right. Everyone has their own uh, what you call, uh, personal assistant who's basically scheduling all these uh, meetings for them. So, do you, you want to kind of share with them? Uh, yeah. Hong Kong could mean a room, Hong Kong would mean actual Hong Kong. Right. So there are different contexts and the different ways that these guys speak or there's standard terminology that these people use all these different people so does it understand from one person and has the capability to apply that understanding to a different person when he's uh, scheduling his meeting yeah so i think it depends very much on the link so example the link between the people right so if it understands hong kong is a meeting room within an organization then if people within that organization speak about hong kong uh then that's definitely it's it's a probabilistic kind of thing you have candidates right is this a meeting room is this a is this a place uh, and then you have to figure out what the use other contextual clues to figure that out. Yeah. I have one, one more question. Can, is Evie smart enough right now? So if I use it in my organization, uh, can she figure out a meeting? If I just say, book a meeting with me and Joe uh, and get us a meeting room, can she figure out a available meeting room as well right now? Or do I need to specify the room? No, she can pick a meeting room. If you are not too bad. Yeah, if I'm on the team, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. she knows the meeting rooms and she can just assign one to me. Yeah, so she'll, as long as I make that caveat around first getting the meeting room integration set up with the cloud of the organization, uh, but then yes, uh, she's getting a looking at choosing a room for you. So can she book hotel? Listen, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I use the process of identifying uh, other use cases uh, on the Yeah, I, I think we have the use cases. I think we're waiting for the tech to catch up. Uh, the team's based in Singapore right now. Uh, we're about eight people, probably. Uh, but we're looking to grow, obviously. So, so how is the split of the team? Is it mostly that I say it is? is it Engineers, mainly engineers. So it turns out like a lot of this is software engineering as opposed to data science or machine learning. So, uh, and in Kali also, I guess, the, the phase of growth, right? If you're building something from nothing, a lot of it is infrastructure and plumbing and software engineering. Uh, and then probably as we evolve and grow, the, that mix will shift towards, okay, let's look at the data, let's look at the, let's refine the models and see better that. Thanks everyone. Thanks.